Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am very happy to uh, be able to talk, you, talk to you about my most favorite skin disease, which is pemphigus foliaceus. And what I decided to do uh, is to make it in several uh, small topics, which will give you the most recent update about this disease. So what I would like to talk first is to introduce pemphigus foliaceus to you as a clinical entity but then I would like to brush up a little bit on the pathogenesis and show you what is new and then let's talk about the canine pemphigus foliaceus and triggering factors what can trigger pemphigus foliaceus what we know what is just hypothesis and then we will finish with talking about acantholytic dermatosis because, as we all know, acantholysis is not a unique feature of pemphigus foliaceus and uh, we should be able to tell these diseases apart. So pemphigus foliaceus, as you can appreciate from the pictures, is a debilitating pustular disease and when I say pustular this is extremely important information because there are not many or there is almost no autoimmune skin disease which would be pustular in origin and so the first primary skin lesion seen in pemphigus foliaceus is a subcorneal very very superficial and fragile pustule and you can imagine that this superficial and very fragile pustule can erode very easily, causing thus a similar lesion as you can see in the, on the picture in the middle. And then because of the rapid turnover of the skin, this lesion has a tendency to crust over. And because this cyclical nature, cyclic nature of the disease, the buildup of the crust can be pretty impressive, as you can see on the picture on the right. The typical clinical presentation is uh, unmistakable. Uh, you can see lesions on the nasal planum, on the dorsal nose, and or it doesn't have to be in every patient around the eyes and on concave aspect of pinna. The facial involvement we call it pathognomic, meaning when you see this uh, mask and you know that this is primary pustular disease, there are not many other diseases which will create this phenotype. We see this facial mask in more than 90% of dogs, meaning there is not, not every dog with pemphigus foliaceus will have this uh, typical classic facial phenotype, but a decent number of them will. And here is just an example of a close-up for the eye lesions. You can see some pustules, but mostly erosions, pinpoint erosions because of the fragile nature, and the same on the pinna. Another area which is commonly affected, and the, the percentage uh, of prevalence depends on which literature you are reading. Uh, it's the, the older studies are showing around 30-40% of dogs. When I reviewed our 120 dogs collected over the last 20 years, the foot pad lesions were detected in almost 80% of dogs. And what you can see in these uh, uh, patients is this prominent hyperkeratosis and crusting, often with cracking, and they may be painful. So the patient may present with lameness, especially if the only clinical presentation of the pemphigus is localized to the foot pads. Pustules in this area are rare. Uh, it is uh, logical. Uh, pustules are fragile and if you are stepping on them they will rupture very uh, quickly. But sometimes if you uh, search very hard you may be able to find pustules around the edge, so between the actual foot pad and the skin of the intergital area. And then, of course, everybody knows or everybody has seen pemphigus cases, so they eventually will progress uh, into generalized phenotype, uh, meaning the trunk and the rest of the body will uh, show clinical signs as well. And again, depending on which literature you are reading, but about 66% uh, of dogs will show generalized lesions. And of course, these generalized lesions with the facial phenotype um, are pretty easy diagnosis, but if you have only 
tranchal lesions in pampigus foliaceus. That's when we are running into uh, confusion and the diagnosis is becoming markedly more difficult and that's what we will be talking about towards the end of the lecture. One thing what you should remember, and again we will be talking about in more details, is the diagnosis of pemphigus foliaceus currently is based on combination of clinical signs and histopathology. And when we speak about combination, think about it as a pieces of puzzle. You put these pieces of puzzle together and they need to fit. You can't use just microscopy and make a diagnosis of pemphigus foliaceus. Sometimes you can use the clinical signs to make it, uh, uh, you know, skilled clinician with the facial phenotype or, uh, seen in the patient doesn't really need uh, much more tests, but just make sure that you don't consider microscopy as the only diagnostic tool. And thing which will give up the diagnosis is pustules. As you will see in the lecture after when we will be talking about other autoimmune diseases, all the others one are blistering. So you will see erosions and ulcers, but you won't see the primary pustule lesions. Once you are able to detect pustule, you know that you are in the pemphigus camp. And then we will talk about acantholysis and subcor and microscopy of pemphigus in uh, later in this lecture. And it's true always rule out other acantholytic dermatosis. And when I say other acantholytic dermatosis, the most common one will be exfoliative superficial pyoderma. And of course, a little bit more rare condition, which we call pustular dermatophytosis. These two diseases, if you take biopsy and send them to the pathologist, they will look identical to pemphigus foliaceus and it will be up to you once your pathologist confirms the diagnosis of subcorneal pustular dermatosis with acantholytic cells, that you go back to clinical signs and make your judgment. So, before we talk about more clinical aspect, let's go a little bit back and let's look at the molecular aspect of this disease and on the pathogenesis because that is where my research is currently uh, in, involved. Pemphigus is disease of desmosomes. Desmosomes are small structures which are responsible for cell-cell adhesion. So they work as a zipper or as a Velcro, which uh, allows keratinocytes and of course other cells. Desmosomes are not just in keratinocytes, but we are talking about skin. So let's talk about keratinocytes in this lecture. It holds them together. And when you look at them from the molecular point of view, you will see that they are very complex structures composed of several different proteins. Some of these proteins are localized inside of the cell. Uh, they, call, call, they create what we call plaque, and this is desmoplakin, placoglobin, and placophilin. And then from these, there are two main transmembrane adhesion proteins which are sticking out of the cell and cross-link with the neighboring uh, cadherins fr coming from the other cells. So you can see that these sticky uh, molecules will literally work like a Velcro and glue the cells together. And the two main proteins uh, which are uh, sticking in, in between the cells and providing the adhesion are desmoglanes and desmocolins. Currently, it is well accepted in human and veterinary dermatology that antibodies targeting these adhesion proteins will lead to cell-cell dissociation and blister formation, which is the beginning of our pustule in pemphigus foliaceus. The exact mechanism how this disruption of cell-cell adhesion happens is not fully understood, not even in human medicine. And there are several different uh, theories, hypotheses, which are trying to explain this phenomenon. The most, the oldest one, uh, is the steric hindrance theory, uh, during which the explanation was that when you have a transmembrane protein and the antibody uh, blocks the adhesion part of this molecule, there is 
inability of these adhesion proteins to communicate and to stick to each other. So it's like physical hindrance that prevents this adhesion.